off as well. All right, um, recording has been started. Um, so I'm uh, Tony Griego. I'm your co-chair for the Latino Leadership Network. And um, so today's agenda is that we're gonna uh, give you a brief update on our Hispanic Heritage Month that's upcoming um, in the mid-September mid to mid-October. Um, today we have guest speaker Larry Delgado from the Department of Enterprise Services, who's gonna be talking to us about uh, the new required state diversity, equity, and inclusion training. Um, his team has been working really hard to, to get that all put together. Uh, from what I've seen, it's very impressive. And um, he, Larry and his team even used some of the information we put together around uh, the Latino state employee experience to, to help uh, guide this training. Um, later in the, after Larry speaks, we're gonna have some, some breakout time for networking. And then um, we'll have some, some brief report outs from our subcommittees, uh, which include health and wellness, diversity, equity, and inclusion, communications, membership and outreach, and best practices. Um, our subcommittees are also an excellent way for you to uh, join LLN and contribute, uh, build up your, your skills and experience, and then also help uh, improve the experience for Latino state employees. That's my pitch. So. Um, Let's see. Jovita, if you could go to the next slide. Okay, so as I, as I mentioned, uh, Larry's gonna be speaking in just a moment. Um, there's this handsome picture. You can also probably see his little video as well. Uh, but first I wanna cover our Hispanic Heritage Month events on the... Could you just advance one more slide, Jovita? Thank you. Uh, we're, we're missing our, co our uh, chair, Abby Chavez, this, this month. So um, I feel like mom has left the building for a bit. So, so the, the kids are managing. Um, so as I mentioned, we have a, a, a wide variety of events coming up for Hispanic Heritage Month, which runs from September 15th to October 15th. Uh, we're gonna kick it off with our general membership meeting, which will be the second Tuesday of the month on September 14th. Um, and then on September 25th, we, we have a planned uh, in-person event uh, at the park, um, which will be at Miller Sylvania, Miller -Sylvania State Park. Um, we will also have a planned event, um, a virtual event on the 28th um, about Latin American Cinema, which is gonna be led by Noemi Solorzano Thompson, um, who will be speaking to us about Latin American Cinema. And then uh, on October 7th, our DEI subcommittee is teaming up with the Rainbow, the Rain, which is the, oh gosh, I need to dial a friend, I'm, I'm blanking on my um, acronym here. Rainbow Alliance is two of them. Okay. Inclusion Network, I think. Thank you, Steve. Oh my gosh, I'm so embarrassed. But it's an exciting event and we're gonna be talking about uh, Latino, Latina, Latine, Latinx um, terminology and the LGBTQ plus community. So that will be a, a very interesting event. Um, I believe you, you may need to pre-register for that one. And then we'll be ending with, again, our general membership meeting uh, in October, on October 12th, um, with a recap of, of all the different events. Um, if you're interested in hearing more about this, we're gonna include it in our newsletter, um, which hopefully you've already signed up for. But um, if you haven't, um, I'm gonna to, to phone a friend and ask Victor. Hey, Victor, um, how might members uh, sign up for our newsletter? Oh yeah, um, I can put a link in the chat that will take them to the sign up page. Okay, thank you, Victor. I hadn't, I hadn't given him the heads up I was gonna do that, so sorry. Um, one thing I wanna point out also is that our, our event for September 25th currently is planned to be an in-person event. Um, it's at a state park, so it'll mostly be outside, but um, that's something that's rapidly developing uh, because 
coronavirus is still very active in, with the Delta variant. Um, and it's important for us to be aware of all this too, because uh, according to, uh, and I'll drop this in the chat in just a second, according to the University of Washington, Washington's Latino Center, Latino or Latino Center for Health vaccinated. So, so Tony, about sixty percent of our population is unvaccinated. Tony, you were freezing up, so I don't know if we got. Oh, okay. So, we have a large unvaccinated population. Um, and, and in fact, in for Thurston County, uh, what the Latino Center for Health found was that uh, seventy-one percent of the Thurston County Latino population is was currently unvaccinated in. July they published this. Um, and and the, they found also um, hesitancy, hesitancy around getting vaccinated due to concerns around safety with the vaccine, um, cost to get the vaccine, and then um, effectiveness around the vaccine. And I'll put these studies in the chat. So if you're interested, you can find them yourself uh, or read them. And um, so the good news is that the vaccine, as far as I'm aware, is free. And I'll drop a link in the department for the Department of Health as well. So um, I just wanted to raise that information because we may need to adjust and move to a virtual event uh, to ensure the safety of all of our uh, members and guests. Um, if all goes according to plan though, we'll, we'll all get together and have a, a, a great fiesta together, but um, it's important to be talking about that. Um, is there any questions about Hispanic Heritage Month? We're looking forward to all these events. Okay, I got the thumbs up from Victor. So I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Larry Delgado from the Department of Enterprise Services. Thank you so much for joining us, Larry, um, to talk about this new uh, training for all state employees. Uh, thank you, Tony, for uh me and thank you, uh, LLN. Uh, I am a uh, member of uh, the LLN. I'm not currently holding any any seats, but uh, the funny thing is, I was a, a, a part of LLN before I even became uh, a state employee as a as a liaison with Pierce Transit. Uh, and uh, you know, things being what they were, were I came to state uh, government employees some uh, employment. So I'm happy to be here with everyone. Uh, and uh, like Tony uh, stated, my name is Larry Delgado. Uh, my pronouns are he, his, him. Uh, I identify as a Latino male, also a uh, veteran of uh, the United States uh, Army. And it's, again, truly a pleasure to be here. Uh, so what I want to do is give a brief overview of the culture of engagement, diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace. For those that haven't heard the spiel of uh, the DEI upcoming training, uh, I'd hope that leave here with some uh, foundational knowledge of what the DEI training is um, and what to expect from the training. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, Okay, so the uh, Department of Enterprise Services uh, DEI team began hiring, uh, I began hiring, became or began hiring, excuse me, the team in February of 2021. Uh, the team is comprised of myself as the DEI development manager and four design and delivery professionals. The primary focus upon hiring the team was to gain an in-depth understanding of the supporting documentation, such as the DEI competencies and the DEI glossary of equity related terms, the various um, uh, executive orders and HR directives that came associated with uh, the governor's intent of uh, developing programs and initiatives to foster a culture of diversity, inclusivity, uh, equity, and respect in the workplace. We meet, uh, we meet regularly with stakeholders from the DEI advisory group to gain their recommendations and suggestions on how we uh, better provide training to all 67,000 plus state employees and refine our uh, modules uh, accordingly. After each iteration of the pilot groups that we launch, and we're currently in the middle of launching pilot groups nine through 14, um, we take feedback on a daily basis for each of the modules to get 
an idea of how the learners are experiencing the training and identifying any commonalities in within the training um, to make those adjustments uh, accordingly. And while maintaining the integrity of the documentation and of the learning objectives that were established by the DEI training committee and the DEI council. So Can after we, oh, I'm sorry, was there a question? Okay. Oh, uh, so <laughs> after we uh, uh, bring our curriculum to the DEI advisory group, we revi revisit, refine, we launched a pre-pilot uh, training uh, in May of this year with 31 uh, DEI professionals, various HR uh, professionals from across uh, all state agencies to get their initial input with the um, pre-pilot. Then we launched uh, pilot groups one through eight, which uh, finished up uh, a couple of weeks ago. Again, uh, we're in uh, pilot groups nine through 14, and this week we're going through module two. Uh, some of the changes that we made to our curriculum was the delivery uh, concept of the, of the curriculum, whereas in the initial half of pilot groups one through eight was a four-day back-to-back uh, curriculum, which was extremely um, fatiguing on our learners, uh, lesson learned. Uh, we then shifted to a once-a-week class in order to make sure that uh, we provide enough space for our learners to uh, go through the training and process the information and the concepts and behaviors that are expected of state employees as we go forward. Once we're done with this next initial or with this next group of pilot uh, programs, nine through 14, uh, and this next or this iteration of pilot groups from nine through 14 is really us utilizing the learning center and the notifications within the learning center to make sure that all those uh, T's are crossed and I's are dotted and that the system is working like it should be with notifications and enrollment for state agencies. Uh, once we're done with this initial, we'll have to revisit and see if there's any additional pilot groups that we'll launch. The good thing is that as we're launching these pilot groups, uh, any individual uh, or any agencies that wish to send their, their employees through this training, will get credit for uh, the pilot programs and won't have to go back and, and go through uh, the uh, curriculum once it's officially launched. So this next slide is, uh, depicts an overview of all five modules and includes the e-learning uh, categories that uh, are recommended for training. The reason why we have uh, three short e-learning uh, courses is for the individuals that are going through the modules that are uh, more uh, novice in their um, DEI journey are able to go through an e-learning, identify uh, definitions that they may not necessarily be uh, familiar with, as well as uh, seeing the DEI competencies and the DEI equity related, uh, uh, glossary of equity related terms. So they can start um, making those connections prior to coming to uh, the virtual instructor led training in that in the in, uh, virtual instructor led training we try to focus more on uh, open discussions and small group activities large group activities uh, watching videos and some reflective exercises for our participants we also um, facilitate and uh, highly encourage that as our learners go through uh, the modules that they identify a specific accountability partner uh, the reason why we uh, highly encourage individuals to identify accountability partners is so they can have someone that's trusted within their either their circle of friends, either within their work groups, within their agencies, within the BRGs, or even us within the DES DEI team um, to have uh, conversations open and honestly and have that and someone that you have that trust factor with. So if you do come across a concept, if you do come across a behavior or even an event that occurs, you have someone uh, that can help you along that journey. Uh, for those of us that used to be uh, uh, physically fit when I was in the military, it's always easier uh, to go to the gym when you have a partner and work out uh, to give you that motivation. So we highly encourage that as our learners go through the DEI uh, culture of engagement tra uh, training that they identify an accountability partner in order for them to have those discussions and uh, talk about best practices. Uh, the, the five uh, instructor-led trainings are why diversity, equity, inclusion, self-awareness, ism awareness, racism, and working together. 
Uh, the slide that you see right now is not all encompassing. Uh, there are some couple of things that are not addressed on here, such as uh, bystander intervention that is captured within uh, the modules. We just ran out of room on this particular slide. As learners go through the training, there's a pre-assessment, a post-assessment, the three e-learning courses, and the end of course evaluation. Uh, the reason that we require a pre and a post assessment is just to be able to gauge uh, learner retention and transfer of knowledge from what learners experience or their um, capacity of knowledge within DEI concepts prior to taking the training and to see if there's any growth associated after they go throughout the training. The last module, module uh, five working together is purposefully um, set aside uh, two weeks later uh, in order for those that are, those learners that go through the training to be able to have those conversations with their accountability partner and set those action uh, plans within the participant guides into motion with their uh, accountability partners. Uh, we are currently also looking at developing a after training cohort of sorts, where we will invite individuals that went through the cohorts, the, the initial rounds of um, culture of engagement training, just to have a, a more in-depth conversation of what's working well in your organizations, what isn't working well, are your work teams supporting, are they not supporting, um, and, and what topics or trends are, are they seeing within their agencies. So that's currently in the work right now to just reinforce and keep that, that our uh, foot on the gas, if you will, and not let up in uh, these uh, upcoming uh, DEI modules and any further initiatives within state government. I will pause briefly for any questions or comments. I see Josefina. Um, yeah, I was gonna say Josefina has a question in the chat. Yes, all state employees, regardless of whether they're a supervisor, manager, are required to go through the training. Um, we are also looking at possible building some capacity to see if we can get some uh, agencies or some organizations that aren't typically within the purview of state government to provide additional training to them as well. But bottom line, Josefina, all, in, all Washington state employees are going to be required to go through the training. You are very welcome. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, what I wanted to do is turn quickly to our learning goals, so everyone on the on the call can see uh, exactly what these learning goals are, uh, and just get some familiarization of the topics that are covered within the training. And again, a lot of these topics we try to focus on uh, small breakout sessions, not to exceed uh, four uh, learners per breakout session as well as large group discussions, debriefs, uh, activities in your participant guide, as well as discussions with other um, learners. So I'll leave that up briefly and see if anyone has any questions or concerns regard regarding the learning goals before we move forward. So, uh, Larry. <clears throat> yes, Ernesto. Um, <clears throat> these uh, learning goals are still under review or they are finalized as they are? These goals were taken um, from the DEI training committee uh, over the past 18, well, now it's probably like 24 months, <laughs> uh, where various stakeholders came together as part of the DEI, uh, some members from the DEI councils some DEI uh, liaisons from state agencies that were um, provided by state agencies to give provide input into the development of what the learning goals and objectives were. These are uh, just a few of the learning goals that were um, taken from the documentation from those uh, group of stakeholders. So there was a total of approximately 54 uh, learning goals. Some of those were consolidated based off of uh, adult learning methodologies and how we structured the training. And these are just a, a few of those. Thank you, Larry. You're welcome. 
Larry, I'm curious, and you, I recognize you might not have an answer for this, but um, I would imagine there may be some state employees who are reluctant to uh, go through a training like this. Uh, is there any guidance around um, how to approach that? Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, as the team came on board in state government, and I'll go over who the team members are, one of the things that I was uh, adamant about when I, when I took the role is to provide some credibility for our team, and not that they didn't have credibility when they were hired based off of their uh, sh uh, shared experiences and education and previous work experiences, but we also wanted to uh, take uh, the additional step to provide trainings. So we had training with Kathy O'Bear, We've had training with uh, Cultures Connecting and Dr. Caprice Hollins. We've had training with um, Aaron Jones. Uh, and we've also had, uh, the team went through a certification process with the University of South Florida uh, at um, discussing uh, race in uh, DEI in the workplace. We also have discussions within the, the team to mitigate those uh, ideologies. And we understand that not everyone is gonna, um, enjoy the ride, but they have to get on the train, right? Uh, and as we go forward, um, is identifying how we navigate those uh, kind of murky waters. Um, and ultimately it comes back to the governor's intent of developing a workforce that's respectful, inclusive, uh, equitable for all state employees, right? Nobody wants to wake up in the morning and be disrespected uh, when they when they wake up in the morning. So utilizing that as a foundation of like, hey, we all have aspirations, we all have goals, we all have things that we hold important, um, regardless of your race, religion, ethnic or um, national origin or ethnic background. We all, for instance, love our families, right? I think that's a, a safe uh, assumption to make. You know, we all want a, a good education for not a, just ourselves, but our children and our, you know, nieces and nephews and uh, those uh, uh, those that are dear to us, we all want a, an equitable chance to to get forward in life. So being able to address it from the perspective of this common need, uh, whether that's psychological or a physical need that we all have as human beings, it's not that different, right? It's just being able to have these this dialogue and this respect and share from each other's shared perspectives and experiences as how we navigate this space together and how someone of color may be experiencing something that you may not necessarily be privy to as someone from the dominant culture as a, a Caucasian male or female, but understanding that we all want the same things within state government. Also, there's a, there's a um, understanding that as, in within any organization, there's certain norms, visions, mission values that those organizations hold, right? It just so happens that state government is highly leaning into the DEI work. And as a state employee, uh, I got two choices, right? I either buy in to the mission, vision, and values of the organization. And if I don't buy in, that's fine as well. But the idea is that I have to, the expectation is that I adhere to the uh, values and the norms of the organization. And if I can't treat someone with dignity, respect, uh, inclusivity, um, then we have to have another discussion as uh, employees of state government. So we, do, we, we have been prepping for those and we have had some uh, feedback on our surveys uh, and identifying what those comments are and how we would address those, right? Because we're gonna run into first race, we're going to run into, well, you know, people of color are racist against white people, right? We're going to run into, well, you know, what about black on black crime? You know, all these things, all these deflections, all these distractions, the team's already prepared and leaning forward on this happens, you know, how do we mitigate or how do we um, lead that discussion um, for better understanding and, and empathy within the workforce? Hey, Larry, um, in, our, in the, the Latino Leadership Network's professional development and inclusion survey, we, we found that um, not everybody is receiving DEI training 
um, or education, you know, depending on where they're located in their agency or what agency they're at. Um, can I ask you just a couple quick questions on, on learning goals themselves? Because I think that might be helpful also. Um, so, so on that, uh, that second bullet around understanding concepts and terminology and behavior, can, can you tell me a little bit more about what that looks like? Right, so some of the concepts, terminologies uh, of DEI work is first and foremost is setting that foundation. It's like why diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace so important. There's countless uh, resources and statistics out there about the benefit of a diverse workforce. Uh, so for instance, in, in one of the, in module one, we talk about if an organization has someone of, uh, that's a person of color that matches uh, someone on the economy, right? They're 152% uh, better chance of identifying the needs of those customers. So we start off with identifying what diversity, equity, and inclusion is, what those benefits are, what those organizations such as the Harvard Business Review, Forbes, Association for Talent Development, the SHRM, all these studies that are out there that say that uh, um, DEI work benefits organizations in these multiple ways. Uh, uh, retention of employees, uh, uh, increase in innovation, uh, increase in, in decrease in decision-making capabilities, right? Uh, so we start off with that. Uh, understanding the terminology is, uh, the, is why we created the e-learning courses because it gives an, a, a, a learner an opportunity to learn on their own who may not necessarily be uh, aware of the, the terminologies. So that's what the e-learning is about. It's like, hey, this is Washington State's definition of diversity. This is Washington State's definition of intersectionality. So individuals that may not necessarily be familiar with those types of terms mm -hmm. um, can get an idea prior to walking into the class. Uh, and as far as the behaviors, we also talk within module one, what are some behaviors that support and, and foster uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion? And what are some behaviors that uh, stand in the way of diversity, equity, and inclusion? And how do we mitigate those barriers? How, we, how do we destroy those barriers while increasing the, uh, the feeling of fostering that culture of, of DEI in, in the workplace? Thanks. Um, okay, so I've got two more questions. So then um, I see various forms of ism. So, so racism is the thing that like is, is like the big obvious piece. I mean, there's a whole like module section on it, but, but what other, I see colorism, sexism, I know there's ableism. What, what other isms might be, be covered with this? Uh, we talk about tokenism and what tokenism is. Uh, so individuals have an idea uh, of not necessarily. So for instance, always going to that Latino or Latina to says, hey, you know, can you talk about this on, you know, Hispanic Heritage Month, right? So I, identifying what those, those things are as well as identifying how intersectionality relates into these things, right? Because sexism, uh, as a woman, you know, who experiences sexism, such as um, being in a meeting, so for instance, and uh, Jovita, I'm gonna use you in this uh, example, I hope you don't mind, but if Jovita says something within a meeting uh, and nobody pays any mind to it, but then Victor comes behind and says the exact same thing that Jovita just said, and everybody jumps on the bagging wagon, is the ability of somebody to pause and says, hey, wait a minute, that's just what Jovita just said. You know, can we give her her, her due uh, her, her, her due credit, um, but also is, is how does that specific group identity um, get more complicated as the layers are added to, you know, that, whether, you know, you're a transgender Black female or whether you're a disabled uh, transgendered Black female, and how does those increase uh, as and, and get more complicated as we go um, throughout that. So we talk about the colorism, right? About how, uh, and you know, this is just some discussion that I've heard um, when I was growing up and, and, and being raised in South Florida is, is the red bone, right? That, that person of color that's light skinned um, with clear eyes gets more attention, gets more respect than a darker skinned person, right? Uh, I've had experience in, in high school where friends of mine were 
um, of Cuban, you know, ancestry who negated that there were any 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 uh, black Cubans, right? And we're like, do you not see the news? So it's those types of things, those types of discussions that we have uh, that help drive that. Hey, we're not perfect. We make mistakes, even though we've gone a, a, a quite a ways. We still have a long ways to go. And if we're not diligent in keeping an eye out for these trends, the pendulum may swing in the opposite direction significantly. Um, and you know, how does that look? You know, as we're looking at institutional, structural, and systems that are are being in, put in place. Awesome, Larry. Okay, there's my... a question. Oh, oh sorry. Oh. Go ahead, Tony. Okay, well, then I'm going to ask my third question, and then we can we can uh, ask Ms. Uh, Oz's question. I apologize if I pronounced your name incorrectly. Um, so I wanted to ask about uh, building allyship because the Latino Leadership Network is is obviously open for Latinos, but we also want to include allies um, who may not identify or or have a Hispanic heritage. Um, so, so can you tell us a little bit about that? Because that's also something too, where I think, um, like you said, you know, Afro Latinx people are often overlooked, and you know, we we partner with the other business resource groups to support each other. And so, I think I'd like to, if you don't mind sharing a little bit about building allyship. Um, no, not at all. And thank you for the question. So, when we're talking about building allyship, is being very deliberate in actions that are needed to build that allyship. Right? There's one thing. To, to be woke on social media and to send a tweet or an Instagram or, or whatever the case may be. Uh, but where that rubber meets the road is how, how much skin do you have in the game, right? And there's a difference between, you know, uh, co-signing on something and being a true ally. And we have, we talk about those distinctions of, are you willing to go out on a limb and say something that's not unpopular if you hear something or you see something, right? And, how, and at every juncture in, in history, we, we've all needed allies, such as the suffrage movement, uh, such as the civil rights movement, um, LGBTQ rights, right? And at each of those stages, we've had allies that may not necessarily be from that community, but respect, cherish, and value uh, the diversity that they bring and stand up with those communities to say, no more. Right, you know, we have to be civil to one another. We have to respect one another, regardless of our differences. And at certain points, value those differences because some of those differences bring added uh, advantages to organizations and work groups. Awesome, thank you. Okay, and then from the chat, we have uh, Ms. Ozzy has a question of, um, will you incorporate specifically anti-racism in the language and training? We do touch on, uh, the initiatives that Washington State has to make Washington State an anti-racist state. So we do call anti-racism out specifically. And there's a couple of quotes that we go through throughout the training that address um, specific uh, um, quotes from uh, authors such as um, Ibrahim Kendi, uh, his book and his work uh, to also talk about that the anti-racism um, aspect of going through uh, being in state government and um, taking deliberate steps to knock down and uh, remove those barriers and systems that have been in place and um, adversely impact uh, underrepresented and marginalized groups. Oh, and it looks like we have a question also now from uh, Luisa. Uh, will there be examples like the one you did with Hovita to illustrate what oppression, power, privilege, and inequities look like? Yeah, and and I don't want to steal the thunder from the facilitators, but we, like uh, like Tony uh, said, that we took some um, real life scenarios that were submitted to the DEI uh, training team to Im to implement in some of these specifically in the um, self awareness and the ism awareness uh, modules that talks about specific scenarios that our learners are gonna go through and have an opportunity to um, utilize specific tools to address microaggressions. So for instance, um, to use that, the, the address model, if some of you may be familiar with that, is the acknowledge, the direct, um, the delegating, uh, things of that nature. So we do use 
real world scenarios there and we do have role playing scenarios within the module. Awesome. Okay. Well, we do you do have more a slide at the end for more questions, so I don't want to derail you too much. I realized that <laughs> I kind of grilled you there, so I'll let you get back to it, Larry. Oh yeah, no, no, not at all. Thank you. I love having these discussions, and and by all means, the uh, I'm I'm willing to to talk to talk until I'm blue in the face. Uh, so quickly, I just wanted to introduce the team. Some of you may be familiar with our team, and what we did when we when I built the team is I wanted to make sure that we built a team that was um, representative of uh, the uh, communities that we serve, not just as far as education, but also as far as experience, as far as um, lived experience. Um, so we have two members that are from uh, state government, which is Deb came from Department of Corrections and Ion came from ESD. Uh, we also have two individuals, one Noemi, uh, as some of you may have uh, had some interactions with her. She's from Higher Learning, uh, and Mr. Sean Willis comes to us, also a combat uh, veteran from the Army that worked with Northrop, uh, Northrop Grumman, a senior instructor for the military, and has uh, his PhD in, in, B in, uh, in business administration. So a couple of more slides and, and I'll be done. So this is just the, the, where we're at right now. 31 participants participated in the uh, pre-pilot from the DEI Council and the EI Training Committee. For pilot groups one through eight, we trained 244 participants from 28 different agencies, received that initial feedback um, and made uh, um, determinations of commonalities within the surveys. And what we did is we launched a survey after each module to identify and um, hone in on those specific modules and whether it was a content issue, whether it was a facilitation issue, um, whether it was a slideology issue in order to provide to go back um, and make those refinements. Well, Larry. Um, oh, yes. If I... Oh, sorry. Was in terms of feedback, what's been what's been the most surprising to you? Um, time, <laughs> uh, and I can't, and, and I have to say that it's not surprising. A lot of the feedback that we we've, we've been getting is like, "Hey, we want more time to have these discussions," which is great, right? But then it's, it's being able to find that balance between having a forty-hour uh, class and the uh, sustainability of having employees uh, out, of the, uh, out of their um, work groups for that amount of time. And so being able to find that balance and being very, very deliberate on how we utilize things such as break, breakout sessions, small group activities, uh, introspective, uh, reflective exercises. Um, so that would be one of the ones that came up. Uh, from what we're seeing is that there's a, a, a good amount of appreciation for the breakout sessions. So there's a more um, uh, intimate discussion being had and not in a large group, as well as um, the um, amount of um, activities that we have. So we have breakout sessions, we have large groups discussions, we have videos, we have work in our participant guide, there's pre-work and then there's e-learning courses to make sure we capture that, that broad uh, uh, breadth of uh, adult learning uh, methodologies um, and someone who may not necessarily um, is, it may not necessarily be a visual learner, you know, we have videos to help them in, in that aspect. So uh, making sure that we had a fine balance um, to keep the uh, learners engaged in the content and engaged with one another. Uh, Larry, <clears throat> uh, linking the quote that you're showing here of uh, the poet Maya Angelou and the experience trying to deliver all those, um, I consider very ambitious uh, learning objectives that you show in the previous slide and that we all kind of thought about those because it's really ambitious. It looks to me ambitious. What was the experience with these uh, 31 participants that took the pilot training? Do you think they felt what Maya Angelou is quoting here or they were more overwhelmed by the, um, 
ambitious uh, information uh, information <laughs> dump onto their brains on that amount of time. Uh, thank you for the question, Ernesto. Uh, I'll be honest with you, the, the initial launch product groups one through eight was a very fatiguing um, uh, expectation and a very heavy lift for those that, uh, as, as you can well imagine, uh, you know, DEI and conversations around DEI work is very traumatic to some. There's a lot of trauma that's revisited uh, based off of our experiences and, and uh, where, we were, where, where we were raised and, and our cultures. Um, so that in and of itself, that four day training back to back was again, like drinking from the, from the fire hose. So when we launched the second group of, of pilot groups, we says, number one, we have to be aware of that fatigue, of the Zoom fatigue. So instead of back to back, we'll have them go through a cohort of once a week. Also is breaking that up in between lunch hour. So individuals can have half of the class between lunch, before lunch, have that, uh, half of the class after lunch in order for them to be able to, to, to break away um, and process the information. Uh, it is, um, we've, heard it we've heard explained that um, it seemed kind of like, again, drinking from the fire hydrant. Um, and we try to make it deliberate um, to approach this from the emerging level of the competency of growth, right? Um, understanding that we're all on our individual journeys. And sometimes we have to, um, what's the saying? If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with a, a group. Uh, so being able to identify those, and even though we may have more experienced um, uh, people along their DEI journey, it's fundamental that we're there as a team, as, as an organization to says, not everyone is at the same point in their journey, and that's okay, right? I wasn't at, that, at the same point of my DEI journey that I was 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, so, and, and it's perfectly okay. It's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to not be as advanced as others, um, but also is understanding that we're approaching this from the emerging level aspect of it in order to get those individuals that haven't had the breadth of experience within diversity work to get to a level where they're aware of the concepts, they're aware of the terminology, they're aware of the statistics. And then the idea is that as they go back to their state agencies as leaders, you know, is what am I doing with my work team to promote what they learned in the basic required training? Because that's just the crawl method. You know, eventually we have to walk and then the understanding is that we're running towards a, a anti-racist Washington state. So Larry, I was in just a, a small portion of the very first pilot. And, and one of the things I saw in terms of feedback was around accessibility. Um, so, so employees that may need an aid or like a screen reader to participate in the training. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think that's something sometimes we overlook with intersectionality too, is that we, we do have, you know, state employees with disabilities and Latino state employees with disabilities too. Uh, yes, so thank you for that, Tony. We are working closely with DSB, uh, the Department of Services for the Blind, um, to vet the products that we develop, whether that's a PowerPoint slide, whether that's uh, a PDF or, or the participant guide. Um, we do our initial checks, accessibility checks within PowerPoint, our accessibility checks within um, uh, Word and, and, and Adobe. But once we do that, Noemi, who's our subject matter ADA uh, expert, um, does an, a, a secondary review of those products. And then the, uh, a third review of that product, if we send it over to our um, lead at uh, um, Department of Services for the Blind in order for them to run it through their um, paces. Because I could, I have NVDA on my computer, but I'm still a visible person. So I can run it, and, but my eyes are still giving me the information. So it's not the same as running it through the Department of Services of Blind where the, the user experience is going to be uh, going through that. So right now, uh, we're at an 80% solution. We're trying to get as close to 100% solution with all of our products. And OME is working um, diligently with uh, DSB and Reg um, to make sure that we, we close that 20% to make, to make it as accessible as possible. 
Also, uh, as we're looking at um, how agencies can uh, um, get other uh, training aside from the basic um, training, this, this five module course, is making sure that any vendor that uh, um, submits their RFP, we're very clear in that, hey, if you do this, we need to, you need to be aware that the products that you develop are accessible for those uh, with uh, visual disabilities or with those that may need an ASL interpreter. Uh, and we work well, we work hand in hand with uh, uh, learning solutions to identify any learners that may require reasonable accommodation. And then we work directly with those individuals to get the uh, ASL interpreters to provide them the products and the documents ahead of time in order for them to be able to review some of those uh, things uh, and provide us feedback. Oh, that's awesome. That's something like it's uh, accessibility, especially digital accessibility is, is like a new, well, seems new to me, expanding world. And um, my agency just got Office 365 and, and I've discovered that Word now makes checking a document for accessibility so easy, but it's easy to overlook just taking that step. So it's exciting to hear you taking that, that lead on that. Thank you. Uh, if there's no more questions, I just wanted to show, whoops, sorry. Uh, this is just a, a depiction of the amount of agencies that have been involved um, in either uh, the pre-pilot, the pilot, or um, uh, providing feedback to the DES, DEI team in order to get the best product available for all the state employees. And that is all I have for now. I can stand, uh, I can uh, hold uh, on the call and answer any other questions or concerns that you may have. And our last slide is just, whoops, sorry about that. This last slide, do you see my contact information? If you have any questions or any concerns or, or you just wanna have a discussion in and around DEI, by all means, send me a, give me a call, send me an email and I'll be more than happy to, to uh, set some time aside for us to sit down and talk. Larry, is there any um, schedule for uh, all state employees to either begin or complete the training, the required training? So what we're looking at right now is, uh, and this is still discussions had about uh, shying away from, you must have this done to a, str a structured um, report reporting factor. We're saying, hey, so after a year, what percentage of your work workforce is trained, right? and having to, to ensure that there's some progress being made towards that. So like, let's say Department of Larry, you know, eight months after this thing is launched, he's still, he, he's remaining at 2% of his organization is trained. You know, there's that accountability piece of saying, what's up with the Department of Larry? Why, why are you only at 2%? You know, is, what are some things that we can do to help increase that? But I think that the the, uh, um, the, the litmus test for that is approximately about a three-year time frame um, to, to track you know, how our state agencies are in uh, having their learners move through the training. Uh, we are currently working, oh, sorry. <laughs> We are currently working on the schedule for after September. Um, the idea is that uh, we don't do a round of training in and around uh, December because of uh, respect of individuals' calendars and um, celebrations and, and holidays that uh, our, our employees participate in um, and being cognizant of that. So our last uh, few pilots will be probably from September, October, to the middle of November um, and, and leaving December alone. So, so Larry, when should we expect to hear about this from like agency leadership for, for us to start beginning this training if we haven't been in the pilot group? 
Well, we have uh, meetings with our uh, with the HR uh, managers and the training managers, and at each of these meetings, they they get received the same information uh, that th this team received, with uh, some exceptions and some more specificity. Um, but they should already be leaning forward and having the discussions with state agencies uh, across Washington State. This should not be a surprise <laughs> to any any state agency. Um, but understanding that in a perfect world, that would be the case. Um, and there's always going to be individuals that may fall through the cracks. Uh, but for all intents and purposes, we meet regularly. And by we, I mean myself, uh, Wendy Endress, who's the chief learning officer, Cheryl Sullivan Cole Glazier uh, meets regularly with the Office of Equity and other stakeholders to um, relay where we're at with the, the launch of the training. So when, when, when do you think I'll be able to sign up? Well, I have the I have to send the proposed list to Wendy okay. today for September through November. So hopefully, um, in the next week or so, that'll be out on the street for the for the dates. We maintain the training to thirty learners per uh, um, cohort uh, because we really want to not load the classroom and focus more on these discussions and shared experiences within classrooms. So we purposefully left it at a manageable level of uh, learners per um, two facilitators. Okay. So, and then uh, Stephanie in the chat has a question. Uh, are the agencies participating in the next pilot groups already set or can agencies participate in the remaining pilots? Uh, Stephanie, that those uh, pilot groups have, are, have already been set. Um, there are some individuals from previous, um, from like previous, from pilot groups one through eight. If somebody missed module five of pilot group one through eight, then we will allow them to, to uh, sit in on module five during the pilot groups nine through 14 in order for them to finish off their series. Um, but unfortunately, uh, it is, those are, are few and far in between. Um, and we're looking to uh, launch another, I want to say six cohorts in September. Another 180 years. So I, I know some some of the people in, in our, our um, meeting today are, are, are supervisors. Do you have any any tips or recommendations um, for supervisors to, to be thoughtful and prepare, you know, to lead their staff through through this training? Uh, so there was thoughts about possibly shifting the uh, delivery concept to focusing in on those uh, leaders, uh, first line supervisors, the managers, assistant managers. Um, but I would say is that um, as as leaders, it's it's upon us, and this is discussed in one of the modules. I think it's the very first modules about what Governor Inslee's expectations is of of leaders and and what he expects us of leaders to enforce and, and promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I think part of the, um, at least in my previous roles that I've experienced is leaders, managers, assistant managers have been hesitant to have these discussions because A, they didn't know how to have the discussions, right? They were unfamiliar with these concepts. And B, they were also um, hesitant because the, there wasn't the overhead cover of senior leaders and the, 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 the expectation that from the top down, this is how we will um, um, behave as state employees towards one another. I think this is a great initiative, um, not just because it's paying my check, but I think that it's a great initiative to say from the top down, leaders on every multiple of those echelons, the expectation is that we, uh, move towards an anti-racist state, that we uh, foster a culture of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And what are things that we, what are things that we see as leaders that we can affect change in, right? Something as simple as um, if my a pool of uh, um, hires isn't very diverse, Maybe I pause or, or what are other options out there that I reach out to other organizations to, to try to find a more diverse um, pool of candidates for this particular role. 
right? Because um, if if we don't, I think part of the problem is that you 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 run into that cycle of if I only hang out <laughs> with people like me, chances are when a job posting opens, I'm going to refer my inner circle, and if my inner circle are only you know, the white dominant culture or if my inner circle is only straight men, then chances are that people that I refer to that position are gonna be white men or white straight men or whatever the case may be. But being able to look at things holistically and saying, hey, I, and, and being honest, saying, hey, my work group has, you know, it, it had, why, why don't I have any people of color in my work group or my work team? You know, is it something I'm doing as a leader, as a, 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 a um, assistant manager that's not, you know, prompting individuals of color or uh, the LGBTQ or persons with disabilities or veterans even uh, to apply and work for me, right? So it's being able to take those deliberate steps of saying, hey, you know, I, I noticed that my work group is not diverse. What are certain steps that I can take to alleviate that? And what am I not doing? What am I not seeing that's uh, uh, that's uh, hindering my ability to have a, a diverse work group? Oh, it looks like uh, Stephanie has another question in the chat. Um, will this training provide additional resources for keeping the conversation going within our agencies or for the DEI groups at individual agencies? Uh, yes, Stephanie, uh, thank you for that. And that was part of the in, the the uh, vendor um, uh, request for proposal discussion that I had briefly mentioned is outside of the, the culture of engagement, emerging level training is going out and identifying uh, third party vendors that can provide training such as unconscious bias training um, or intersectionality training, right? That meet the, the DEI concepts and terminologies that we utilize but also helps drive that conversation um, forward. Uh, so when individuals leave culture of engagement, what we're seeing is that a lot of people are like, so what's next, right? So, so what else is out there? And working, we're working with uh, our, through uh, our contracts and procurement to identify vendors to provide additional DEI training for agencies. Okay, Larry, I'm looking at the uh, slide. Uh, I've got another screen with um, your team on it. And I'm wondering who has the most degrees in your team? Because uh, it's a very highly educated group. Uh, masters and PhDs. I'll tell you, it's not this person right now. Uh, but, you know, that was, that was not just um, deliberate and purposeful, but also looking at their... Um, work history. Uh, I, I wanted to have a team that had the experience of state government, but also had that experience with diversity work. Um, so looking at that, and obvious, and that was uh, part of the uh, job posting, but also being very deliberate and, and making sure that uh, my team not, just didn't have, you know, gender diversity or racial diversity, but also neurodiversity, right? I'm, I'm more of a, of a touchy feely person with, you know, a 35,000 foot level view, but I know that I need that detail oriented person, right? That one that, that, that crosses the dots in, or crosses the T's and dots the I's and that individual that, that, that's more detail oriented. So taking a look at how I build a team is identifying not just the diversity in the communities we serve, but you know, diversity in thought, diversity in, in experiences, diversity in education, um, because part of it is building that structure for promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion. And if we're not doing that as, as, a, as a DEI team, then I wouldn't feel right in, in that. So that was part of uh, why you see the, the, the um, resume of the teams that, that's so across the, the, the breadth of education and experience. Yeah, I, that I, my experience in, in just the brief amount of, of interaction that I've had with your team has been very positive and I've been very impressed with everybody on the group. So I Thank you. don't mean to make light, but that's a lot of, it's a lot of, uh, a lot of education there. So, um, does, do we have any other questions from the group? I, I realize I've been, and, uh, interviewing Larry quite a bit here, but I want to make sure to provide uh, space for everybody else's voices too. Larry, I have a quick question for you. Yes, Steve. What, 
what, if any, is the coordination with either uh, OFM or the Office of Equity? Is there is there any in the in trainings? Yes. So we work hand in hand with Flora and uh, and also with um, Dr. Johnson. Each one of the the facilitators uh, met with Dr. Johnson and myself, and we provided her what you know what we were referred to in the in the in the in the military as a as a desk side briefing. So we provided her with the participant guide. We provided her with the slides, and we literally walked through all of the slides to get her impact and feedback uh, in order to help form uh, the the curriculum. And we meet with OFM regularly uh, and and Flora regularly to identify, you know, where we we uh, make adjustments. Excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And again, thanks, Tony. Thanks for everyone on here. I truly appreciate your time and I will hang out. Okay, well, uh, thank you again, Larry. Um, it's really exciting to see. I know this is a huge amount of work um, to put together training um, just due to the, to the size of the, the topics covered, but also all, all the work to really make sure that the um, diversity of experiences and viewpoints is included in, in it. And then also to make sure that it's, it's actually accessible to everybody that, that can take it and is meaningful to everybody too. Um, I'm also glad to hear that you're switching to one session a week because uh, it's a lot to get through and uh, really make it meaningful as part of all of that. So yeah, we um, to give the learners what they want. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think next up we have uh, breakout sessions to, to do some some networking and meet uh, fellow members. Um, we're going to 